Good afternoon. My name is Connie Lester. I'm an associate professor in the history department at the University of Central Florida. I'm also the editor of the Florida Historical Quarterly. And for the purposes of this panel, you should probably know that I am a board member of the LGBTQ um, Museum that will be discussed. Um, the title of this panel is Queer History and Pre a Precarious Memory. Uh, our two presenters are Nikki Fragala Barnes and Alexis Rodriguez. And uh, Ms. Barnes will start off our panel. Uh, let me introduce her to you. Uh, Nikki Fragala Barnes is an arts and humanities scholar concentrating on place-based public histories of vulnerable communities. Also a poet, Barnes is an instructor of creating creative writing at the University of Central Florida. She serves on the board of directors for the LGBTQ History Museum of Central Florida. And while earning her PhD in texts and technology, she also serves as the inaugural Bradley Otis Fellow with the Rollins Museum of Art, designing its first comprehensive DEAI initiatives. Barnes' work emphasizes critical making public scholarship and archives as sites of activism. Her research interests include digital ethics of consent, sites of memory, restorative historiographies and digital deterioration. She serves as an ethics ambassador with UCF Center for Ethics, which works to integrate ethics within all areas of research. The title of her paper is LGBTQ Research and Archival Practices with Vulnerable Publics. Ms. Barnes. Thank you so much. Thank you to the University of Central Florida and their history department, and certainly Dr. Connie Lester and Dr. Ben Broatmarkle for their work with the Schaffner Lecture Series. To begin, Queer histories have been suppressed within the dominant heteronormative culture. Centering significant sites among the built environment for LGBTQ individuals, I worked with digital tools and emerging media methods to survey the LGBTQ History Museum's digital collections and create a curated micro collection of video pathways of engagement for users and researchers of the archives specifically centering a case study of Parliament House, the first openly gay resort, which closed in November, 2020, and is now being reconceived as a downtown Orlando nightclub. I will share the process and project of building a video portrait emphasizing LGBTQ cultures and the discourse of belonging. In the absence of a verified multi-source institutionalized record, there are complications due to conflicting remembrances. This work also strengthens the justification for the argument to rigorously establish more apparent research sites, specifically of LGBTQ histories and generally of non-dominant groups. The LGBTQ History Museum of Central Florida began in 2005 and was formalized in 2010. Its mission is to collect, preserve, and exhibit the history of the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender community in Central Florida. Even earlier, the seeds of this museum can be traced to a grassroots initiative that came into being from a dynamic group of students who found a strong advocate in a University of Central Florida faculty member. More than a decade later in 2005, that faculty advisor, Ken Kazmarski, was invited to contribute to a local history exhibit by creating a display of LGBTQ history using photograph collages. From that collaboration, the GLBT History Project grew, eventually crystallizing through the work of a dedicated collective into the LGBTQ History Museum of Central Florida. The vision for the museum is essentially educational in nature, the museum seeks to illuminate the struggles, triumphs, and experiences of the Central Florida LGBTQ population. In the state of Florida, there are modest collections at several universities. However, as of 2021, this is one of only three museums centered 
on collection, research, documentation, and exhibitions of queer history. The others are both in Fort Lauderdale, the Stonewall National Museum and Archives, founded in 1972, and the World AIDS Museum, which opened in 2014. The LGBTQ History Museum of Central Florida maintains its materials via online archives and a small storage base. The online collections are organized into five areas, digital collections, oral histories, personal collections, a publication archive, and a photo archive, consisting of tens of thousands of files, objects, and narratives. The materials are extensive and diverse. Items have been cataloged and tagged diligently as the collections grew. Nevertheless, accessibility and search engine capability have outpaced the work of the all volunteer board and its interns. In 2020, I was invited to serve on the board of directors because my public advocacy and research areas aligned with the museum's mission and vision. Working with materials that center people who belong to queer communities begins by defining what is categorized as queer content. Cursed, researching film archives, defines queer content as made by queer filmmakers and or perceived as queer by audiences. But in addition, I add to that, that materials that depict queer subjects should also be included. The primary goal is to safeguard queer cultural heritage from being ignored, misrepresented, censored, lost, and destroyed. Kirsch discusses the extensive challenges to collecting and preserving these works, both amateur and professional, as well as the difficulties in sustaining accessible archives. The arguments here are presented to establish the goals and needs for building these places and processes. The existence and maintenance of these repositories, along with the necessary coding and tagging data, serve to contextualize and interpret the historically erased histories of queer lives in the US and beyond. They can also serve as queer sites or environments for research, academic and otherwise. The major pillars for this ongoing work are environment, context, material, and story. And the key is access. Together with the museum board president, I first conceived a video project of pathways into the collection that would function as entry points for users and researchers. Formulated as a 10 video project, we were addressing the evident need for centralized engagement to support navigating the extensive collections. The priority is to first identify specific areas to feature and then select representative items. Throughout 2021, I began by researching the archives, surveying the museum's digital collections to identify and select artifacts for this spotlight series of videos. I built a list of topics and themes and identified collection items within these topic areas. I created a preliminary list for the three series, though for the purpose of this paper, I will limit the discussion to the development of the first series and the production of the pilot video episode. The scholarly practice of curation is an applied form of critical making where the creative and academic work merge and both the process and object are documented in an exhibit. As I engage with this form of scholarship, I am building an experience for researchers and the community at large to encounter a set of artifacts via the digital platform as an entry threshold to invite and encourage further engagement. My efforts here draw on my work creating thick contextualizations that include specific nuanced descriptions portraying queer people in places with empathy, understanding, and rigorous research practices. During the pre-production stage of this series of video pathways, I employed a methodology with a set of key principles to build in accountability. Committing to on-location filming grounded this born digital product by activating spatial rhetorics that position the intended audience closer to the environment. I developed criteria to center the experiences of people in the LGBTQ community foreground material objects closely linking physical experiences, 
prioritize on location filming, direct viewers to additional sites of research, and depict the histories of the LGBTQ community to explicitly resist characterization as a monolith while emphasizing accessibility with language, translation, and captioning. The first series consists of episode 1.1, Social and Bar History, which is the Parliament House, 1.2, Pride Events, 1.3, Student Activism and Community Building, the GSU at UCF, and 1.4, Lesbian Communities, and 1.5 queer art that is also multilingual and transnational. These selections speak to the specific political component of existing as queer in public spaces. The three series directly address political and racial histories. They explicitly extend historical presence of queer communities to incorporate local lifestyle aspects that have been neglected and overlooked for the pilot episode, I share a brief profile and contextualization for each subject. And this is the structure for each one. This curated micro collection serves as multiple pathways of engagement for users and researchers of the archives. Additionally, this series will be posted and shared via social media to engage a community of supporters of the museum, the LGBTQ community, and history scholarship. This work is at the intersection of historiography, digital humanities, critical curation, and emerging media. Anchored in places and spaces, this digital series connects queer spaces that have been, are, and will be. The approach foregrounds the cumulative history of queer community engagement while also addressing the challenges of documenting and preserving culture as member subjects within the population age. Before scripting the video episode, I drafted elements to provide context to the project series that would be included in every video. This consists of all the about text, about me, about the project and its criteria, about the museum. A main focus of this project is to introduce the content of LGBTQ history to audiences who may not have already engaged with this field. Therefore, and as in all things, context is key. Drafting these elements is a significant aspect of my own methodology to acknowledge the frameworks within these objects, this research, and that I am situated. This process and practice of generating these texts is an act of scholarship that clarifies and strengthens the scaffolding of the project. I drafted the pilot episode profiling the Parliament House Resort by featuring the program from its 1975 grand opening, contextualizing the historical moment of its landmark beginning and November 2020 closing with the lens that the first iterations of Parliament House's history exist only in human memory and archive data. Writing the script was the final step in a long research process to verify names, dates, and a great deal of historical data, a primary aim of this work. So these products enter the academic record as scholarly artifacts themselves. I created captions and transcripts, and I am collaborating on translations to accompany the videos. The skeleton structure of each video will include the following, selection title and image, a profile of the subject, historical context and significance, the about texts, and additional resources for further inquiry. This is an excerpt from the script from the pilot episode on the Parliament House. Parliament House opened as the first of a small chain of hotels in 1962. In 1975, it was purchased by two established entrepreneurs, Bill Miller and Michael Hodge of Orlando, and reopened in 1975 as a gay resort called Parliament House Resort Hotel. It closed in November 2020, in large part due to the lockdowns on travel and closings of many tourist attractions in an effort to respond to the public health crisis of the COVID-19 worldwide pandemic. This episode features the program from that grand opening, which took place from Monday, September 29th through the weekend of October 3rd through 5th, 1975. 
The program itself is an item stable bound four page program detailing the events planned for guests. The opening page contains an enthusiastic welcome from new owners, Bill Miller and Michael Hodge. It's clear from the messaging that this was circulated in advance of the event, encouraging prospective guests to book with details and rates on room reservations. $14 for a single and $16 for a double with a $3 upcharge for an additional person and a note that pageant contestants could take advantage of a special rate. Detailing the Miss and Mr. Parliament House pageant, the program also contains a lined entry form for entering the pageant. The Miss Parliament House pageant would take place on Monday, the 29th of September with sportswear, swimwear, evening wear and talent. And the Mr. Parliament House pageant took place on Wednesday, the 1st of October with self-expression, swimwear and talent. It's filled with drink specials and details with an opening cocktail party ahead of the festivities that begin in force on Thursday with a barbecue luau on the beach of Rock Lake and a disco party that night with a dance contest. Friday and Saturday featured a Playhouse Theater production of the Broadway musical, MAME. And Sunday is, quote, to rest and give everyone a chance to unwind from a fun-filled week, end quote. There's a special boxed announcement invitation to a grand opening kickoff cruise out of Daytona on Sunday, the 28th of October for $9.95 a person with 25 cent beers. Of special interest are the included advertisements from vendors present on the property and local establishments. A haircut shop, the Gay Blade, a boutique and florist are listed as within the resort and the Palace Club on Humphreys is also listed open for dancing until 6 a.m. Additionally, this program is goldenrod or marigold in color and it echoes in a small way, the function of the Green Book, first published in 1936, the travel guide for black motorists and tourists, which was in turn inspired by earlier books published for Jewish travelers. Additional links and resource follow the video, discussing belonging and spatial rhetorics with suppressed histories. There are specific vulnerabilities present as members of the LGBTQ community who embody an identity that has been criminalized, oppressed, and persecuted. Public spaces could contain imminent danger. People who identify as queer often develop self-preservation coping behaviors to decrease the risks and punishments of visibility among the dominant heterosexual population. Presence itself becomes precarious. The emergence of queer spaces through bars, bookstores, etc affords queer people places to belong. Because the typical landscape consists of places that are socially coded to welcome and reinforce mainstream dominant heteronormative culture, they have written out queer narratives and ways of being. Queer spaces are a refuge. Preserving this history can have higher stakes as people and places disappear. The work of historians is negotiated among intersecting and equal aims, research, documentation, interpretation, preservation, and contextualization. As I work through the production stage of this curated series of video pathways, I am working within these prongs of history. What we are asking now is who tells the story? Who decides what is written into the narrative? A disproportionate amount of queer history is traumatic and focused on human rights violations. Sites of memory are often sites of tragedy and violence. I argue that while there are evident challenges involved, the concentrated efforts on officializing these narratives, only these narratives, histories, memories, and identities into one is by definition exclusive, harmful, and narrow. There is space for the commemoration of tragic events, though that is not the entirety of the community's history. Resistance has been reduced to a buzzword so as to have sloughed off much of its productive meaning. Nevertheless, resisting the tendency to draw straight timelines, emphasize progressive positivist narratives, and establish a single perspective is necessary so as not to eliminate the presence of the people in history in our present. 
To practice history is to work with threads and stories and objects that do not fit neatly together, jigsawed into clean alignment. Acknowledging the processes, the choices, and the elements of random chance. These are each relevant and significant. Working specifically with queer histories, which are so deeply personal and intimate, I am committed to maintaining truths and aspiring to contribute to the healing and strengthening of our society as a whole. Academic scholarship that experiences claiming without erasing is key to documenting a record that recognizes the argument within a curated collection. Responding to the question of what really happened is never neutral, even when we are addressing what really happened after with the spaces, with the memorializing, with the legacy we build as sites of research. This critical research and academic practice in the arts and humanities is confronting the dominant historical records, the way material culture embodies resistance and place-based histories of the excluded. Interpreting events and experiences within the context of location, especially the built environment, heightens the human encounters with presence and absence. This work foregrounds landscapes and stories of people historically excluded from the narratives and is restorative in both process and product. Thank you. Alexis Rodriguez is a graduate student in the history program at the University of Central Florida and is vice president of the LGBTQ History Museum of Central Florida. His research interests include the history of early LGBTQ communities and subcultures in the Maghreb region, discourses on sexuality and the development of modern day LGBTQ movements and communities. He is also interested in theoretical discourses related to cross-dressing and social acting along with the preservation of materials within archives and historic sites and theoretical issues related to memory and historical narratives. The title of his presentation is Queering History, Intersecting Issues of Historical Preservation and Collective Memory. The history of the LGBTQ plus community has been a subject of discussion within the historical field due to its controversial nature in historicizing sexual orientation and notions of sexuality. However, contemporary scholars such as James T. Sears, Nan Alamila Boyd, Rocio Roque Ramirez, and John Howard have demonstrated the necessity of preserving such history as part of the greater initiative in giving voice to those who are marginalized by the heteronormative society. Attempts, both local and national, have been made in order to preserve such history, including the LGBTQ History Museum of Central Florida. Founded in 2005, the museum has centered its focus on the historic preservation of Central Florida's LGBTQ plus community through local outreach. This entails gathering interns and volunteers from local colleges and universities, participating in the Orlando Pride Parade, showcasing exhibits both on the museum's website and at the center, a nonprofit LGBTQ plus community service organization, and conducting a quarterly book club, which focuses on the LGBTQ plus authors and writers. In the summer of 2020, I became an intern for the museum under the supervision of Dr. Rosalind Byler and then Vice President David Madison, and was assigned to conduct research on a photograph collection of various female impersonators, which spanned over six decades. The project consisted of organizing metadata associated with the image, the performer, the event, along with the creator, date taken, item type, and location. Information pertaining to these images were relatively enigmatic, which made collecting and organizing the metadata difficult. Due to the lack of information, I began to use social media platforms such as Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter as tools in collecting information and contacting potential sources. Within the collection was a series of calendars which fortunately had the photographer's watermark. And by contacting him through Instagram, I conducted an oral history related to the calendars, performers, and the photographer who's also a female impersonator. Through developing this connection with Locke Robertson, and discussing with his associates the museum's project in gathering Central Florida's LGBTQ plus history in person and through social media, others join in offering some of their stories and providing potential contacts. In addition to Instagram, 
I also managed to collect information through crowdsourcing on the museum's Facebook page, which then promoted a discussion among patrons at Parliament House Orlando, allowing me to examine the relation between collective and individual memory. Several of the images posted maintain a rather ambiguous reply, with some commenting only the name of the performer. In examining the use of social media and historical crowdsourcing, Amanda Grace Sikarski comments that Facebook is challenging the traditional channels of scholarly communication, and crowdsourcing is changing the way in which I approach the writing of history. Salamami, Salamami Yadin, researcher at the Istanbul University, discusses the use of Facebook as a means to encourage various exchange of knowledge, assist in nurturing socialization and build community. While the use of social media aided in research and outreach, much of the history related to the, some of the photographs was kept alive through the preceding generation who saw the transformative years of Central Florida's LGBTQ plus community during the 1970s and 80s. This of course presented a dilemma as many from the preceding generations were not familiar with platforms such as Zoom or video teleconferencing software programs, and many were at an age which made them more susceptible to the COVID-19 virus. After much deliberation and through taking the appropriate precautions, I began to conduct oral histories in person following the CDC guidelines to gather as much history as possible, especially after the passing of Sammy Sangaus, or known on stage as Miss Sammy, who was both an Orlando icon and Broadway performer. His unfortunate passing after setting up an a date for an interview further motivated me to seek out and preserve the history of Central Florida's female impersonation subculture. Through conducting and collecting oral histories which primarily focus on female impersonators, I came to realize the intricacies in attempting to preserve this history and how it plays into the issues of historical erasure of certain subgroups and cultures to the notion of collective memory. I shall touch on the following points which were brought up throughout my research issues regarding information relating to the early LGBTQ plus history, historical erasure through archival and popular narratives, and issues relating to memory and sites of memory. This work also investigates the limits of documenting marginalized subcultures within the greater LGBTQ plus community, along, the along with the challenges faced in conducting oral histories due to the COVID-19 pandemic. As mentioned before, the internship began during the COVID-19 pandemic, which initially limited research to databases suggested by the history program's internship supervisor, Dr. Scott French. Unfortunately, the information that was needed was not available or found in the archival database provided, which brings into question the focus of LGBTQ plus histories. Many of the databases provided information relating to gay social movements and popular gay sites and events, which raises several issues. Much scholarship on LGBTQ plus history has centered around certain locations which are deemed historical through popular discourse. Due to this national framework, much of the local LGBTQ plus history has been neglected and its part in the development of the greater LGBTQ plus movement, including the role of female, female impersonators. The narrative of what is deemed gay or queer history based on these sites make potential research not only exalt itself in providing the repeated narratives of these places within the national memory, but often repeat the same framework that prevents further investigations of potential queer spaces within gay history. Historian Pierre Nora has argued that sites of memory, whether cultural objects, symbols, or rituals could invoke collective memory and help build identity. While history of Central Florida's LGBTQ plus community prior to the 1960s was seldom due to its closeted and small community, the demographics and culture within the region changed. The arrival of several organizations and businesses such as the Kennedy Space Center in 1962, the University of Central Florida in 1968, and Disney World in 1971 increased the development of various establishments which catered to the LGBTQ plus population. In 1972, Bill Miller, Michael Hodge, Jan Corin, Wally Wood, and Suhana, who eventually became known as a gay and lesbian gang, sought to create gay and lesbian clubs and bars in Orlando two of which hold significance for both gay and female impersonation history, the Diamond Head and Parliament House Orlando. The Diamond Head, considered the first gay bar of Central Florida, was purchased by Bill Miller and Michael Hodge, and was a venue that provided a show bar for female impersonators and pageants such as the Miss Diamond Head. The date of its closing is unknown. Parliament House Orlando, once a part of a hotel change in the early 1960s, was purchased by Bill 
Miller and Michael Hodge several years later and closed in November of 2020. The significance of Parliament House in particular demonstrates the necessity of investigating other historic sites of memory. While Parliament House Orlando was considered a safe haven for Orlando's LGBTQ plus community due to social homophobia and recognized as, quote, one of the oldest gay resorts and entertainment complexes in the United States, end quote, the significance of this site expands to other community and subcultures. Within this gay resort was a footlight theater where after the diamond, head, the diamond Head became a popular site within the, the national female impersonation subculture. Through my conversations with drag performers, the Diamond Head in the Parliament House Orlando was mentioned as key locations in the history of LGBTQ plus entertainment and yet was also a place of contention. Several performers from the early days mentioned that the use of the handkerchief by Orlando police would request random individuals at Parliament House to wipe their face while making their rounds as a means to arrest LGBTQ plus people who were female impersonators under the pretext of concealing their identity. Due to this, many of the performers refrained from dressing as impersonators before and after their performances in comparison to contemporary drag performers who commonly dress prior to shores and venture throughout the bars and clubs. Yet at the same time, this does not hinder the later creation of drag houses in Central Florida. As shown on the slide above, each of these performers though not only them, played a pivotal role in the development of Central Florida's drag subculture, yet were absent from the archival narrative, including the role said subculture played in the development of Central Florida's LGBTQ plus community. The popularity of pageantry, for example, placed Central Florida and South Florida in the periphery of the greater female impersonation subculture. As the creation of the state pageant Miss Florida in 1972 and subsequent uh, subcategories allowed Florida's female impersonators to travel and participate in national, national pageantry, as well as bring the attention of potential visitors and residents to the region. The Footlight Theater also played a role within this as Miss Central Florida and other similar pageants were held at Parliament House Orlando as a precursor towards entering the national pageants. The development of these subcultures throughout an era of social homophobia should not be discredited as mere entertainment history, but rather an important development towards the historic narrative. Through the collection of information through oral histories and conversations with female impersonators, my research demonstrated to me how the Footlife Theater played an important part to not only Central Florida's drag subculture, but the other issue which emerged in my research was in locating historic, historical narratives in the archives, which were outside the boundaries of cis narratives. Within the archives, much of the narrative found is centered around cis, white, gay males and the venues they attended through pamphlets and flyers, along with social activism and protest. Seldom information is given about lesbian, bisexual, trans, and queer plus people, and even more so, even more so female impersonators. Yet, by the same token, my research demonstrated that the information provided in regards to female impersonators centered around white performers seldom in regards to Black and Latino drag performers. Through networking and conducting oral histories, I came to understand that Central Florida's drag community since the 1970s was and is racially, sexually, and genderly diverse. Through my conversations with female impersonators throughout the preceding decades, it was brought to my attention the issue of trans history. Locke Robertson in his oral history interview titled Men in Heels Calendar explained that several female impersonators were in fact transgender and used this entertainment platform as a means to transition and eventually live out their authentic lives. Yet, in my conversation with earlier female impersonators from the 1970s and 80s, it was explained that the idea of female impersonation used as a safe space for, trans for the transgender community was rather seldom. The conflicting narratives was further pointed out with Rusty Fawcett, a drag performer in the 1970s, who provided a list of performers during their era who did transition. Out of respect, I was asked to refrain from mentioning their names. However, there is a clear indication that the narrative of female impersonation currently presented is not demonstrating the inclusivity of the trans community in the development of historical narratives. As seen in the slide above, I'm going to find a handful of female impersonators that either attempted and or transitioned. With the exception of Paul Wegman on the left-hand side, the performers shown used the drag scene as a means of transitioning, especially during the times where it was still considered socially taboo. 
as stated by Tia Devine, bottom line, would argue that drag was a means to survive as you transitioned. Not a lot of job opportunities were available for trans people, so you can imagine someone visibly going through that process, the scrutiny and discrimination they faced. Being a drag performer allowed me, allowed many, including myself, a means to survive and transition somewhat comfortably." End quote. It is clear that the preservation of female impersonation history is also part of the preservation of trans history, one that needs to be examined in how it plays a role in the social development of trans rights and movements. As mentioned before, the role of memory in the development of LGBTQ plus historic narratives needs to be a subject of discussion. Maurice Halbwak, a pioneering figure in the field of memory studies, realized that history was molded through a collective memory, dependent on both the group's given framework and time. This analysis stems from Durkheimian theory of collective representations as Halbach's social class in accordance with the Durkheimian theory of collective representation that's centered on class consciousness, i.e. the ways in which people classify themselves. For Halbach, the hierarchy of classes facilitates a worldview of their own, one that provides different lenses in observing and interpreting the past along with developing different patterns of behavior and consumption. However, Anne Green demonstrates certain theoretical issues which blossom the convergence of oral history and memory studies, examining how historians whose pursuit in demonstrating leaves little space for the consciously reflected individual or for the role of experience in changing the ways in which individuals view the world. Green also calls into question the use of Halbach's theory in deciphering social structures and memory, as a sociological framework of community and group identity emphasized by Emily Durkheim was developed in the context of European nation building, searching for traditions and rituals that could legitimize nation states. This approach disregards conflicting memories, suggesting that those memories would eventually fade from the collective memory. Green contests such notions as oral historians need to reassert the value of the individual experience and the individual's capacity of contesting and critiquing such scripts. Quote, rather than seeking to fit oral narratives to pre-existing cultural representations or psychoanalytic templates, would it not be more fruitful for oral historians to explore those points of conflict and rupture in people's lives that create confrontations with discourses of power, end quote. Both arguments was demonstrated throughout my research. Due to the absence of the drag history within the archives, much of the information stems from individual oral histories conducted. As mentioned before, the, the significance of Parliament House Orlando varies according to the collective group. For female impersonators, it remained an important part of drag history. Yet for others, it was simply an important gay resort which acted as a safe haven. Even outside the context of female impersonation, the emotions expressed regarding Parliament House varied among patrons and bartenders, some in favor to the changes in, which occurred since dawn and Susan's uh, management, while others preferring through memory, the time when Bill and Miller, Bill Miller and Michael Hodge held management. Regarding the theater, however, all recall the sense of enthusiasm, honor, and fondness. The theater seems to also represent a focal point of harmonizing conflicting memories, following, following suit to what Halbach would deem again as organizing the collective. Following the logic aforementioned, the Footlight Theater, both as a site of memory and an optimization of their performance. The exchange of memories throughout the social, me throughout social media also demonstrates and reinforced in what Halbach would deem as collective memory. Once a person, quote, clarified, unquote, an error in the previous comments, the group began to agree to said person and mold the information into one historical account. However, by the same token, certain individuals like Willie Tillman, who's also a female impersonator, would contest and assert his memory due to his long tenure at Parliament House, Orlando, in comparison to the later patrons. Other issues that came up pertain to conflicting memories of events, dates, and physical locations. While Parliament House, Orlando became a key location in conducting oral histories and gathering information, many of the female impersonators remained at their houses. Regardless of the COVID-19 pandemic, access to this information was needed, and the preliminary steps were taken in order to collect both sets of information and keep everyone safe. Keeping six feet apart from the interviewee, wearing masks, 
and conducting regular COVID-19 tests allowed us to navigate the pandemic to our best capacities. And collecting information related to performers, I realized certain theoretical issues pertaining to oral history as well. While I, while I interviewed certain subjects, I often realized that the gaze was, was reflected back at me. And as an interviewer, I became the subject, noticing every gesture to the statement made and whether, which whether prevented or further provided information. This, of course, plays a role in the power historians hold in collecting information to present a cohesive narrative, along with the digitization of history and shared authority, which has remained central in discourses between historians and the community they examine. This sense of authority presented through the archives show how we continue to exercise this power, quote, to decide what counts as evidence and what is excluded, end quote. Yet the role of social media, Facebook, as an example in crowdsourcing demonstrates the importance of sheer authority developing the narrative. Zikarski states that social media shifts the role of authority from being vested solely in historical cultural domain, such as the museum or the university history, history department, to being shared with the community or user-generated body of information that is critiqued within the community. Academic historians are beginning to recognize that this outpouring of lay scholarship on Facebook and through other social media These are simply a few issues that, I've, that have come up with the lack of historic discussions on as certain factors such as memory, historical erasure, through archival collection and popular ideas of historic sites have shaped the historic narrative, narrative. Due to the lack of funding, the museum is run through an all volunteer board and internships, which prevents further analysis on the potential histories, which may help shape and explain the significance of Central Florida's LGBTQ plus history on a national level. As vice president, I've continued my research on the importance of female impersonation within Central Florida's LGBTQ plus history, doing social outreach, conducting oral histories, and developing a relationship with the said community. I hope by doing this, the research will spark further discourse relating to the necessity of preserving the history and the role the community plays in developing that history, which includes not only cis, white, and gay performers, but those that are lesbian, bisexual, trans, and queer plus people. As stated in the online exhibit titled Preserving Pride, 15 Years of the LGBTQ uh, History Museum of Central Florida, quote, we will continue to tell our community story in order to inspire future generations of activists. The museum is also working to make our collection more inclusive, to add more stories from lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people, Spanish speakers, people of color, and those with disabilities. And we will continue to add to our virtual museum and look for spaces where we where our mobile exhibits can teach and share our history to honor those who have worked for the rights we have today and provide models for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis. Um, so now uh, what I would like to do is, is ask some questions for, uh, in some cases, further clarification or also maybe to, to push your papers a, 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 little, a little further than they went even. Um, so I will, I will pose the questions and I will ask both of you to respond for, to them. So, um, so one of the things that um, seems to me comes up in both papers, but in part because of their, their focus on Parliament House and the things that happen in Parliament House, is the intersection of the queer community and the um, entertainment industry that develops in Florida. And I know both of you um, have, because we've discussed it before, both of you have, have read um, Julio Capo's book, um, which won a number of prizes from the Florida Historical Society and other places as well, in which he focuses on queer Miami before 1940. Um, and for those in the audience who don't know this book, Welcome to Fairyland is the name of the book. And in the book, he talks about the way in which the, the queer spaces, the bars, the entertainment centers in, in, um, in Miami were tolerated by the community during tourist season because it brought lots of people into the area. 
but then uh, were not so tolerated in the off season. But he also talks about the way in which those spaces help to create identity, if you will, um, in the queer community. What kind of effect do you think these entertainment spaces in Orlando had on the queer community? That is such a great question. And I know you know how much I love that book. And I feel like we could have a whole fun panel just on that. Um, I think what is really interesting about Parliament House specifically is it functions as not, not only one single venue. It really functions as a site of um, like a mini community in itself. Um, of buildings, of businesses, of there are several theaters on the campus, in, plus including the um, hotel spaces. So entering the resort is, it's very much a departure, I would say, from the, the city of Orlando's civic spaces, mainstream spaces, heteronormative spaces. Um, but I also see that in some, especially from um, Capo's research, there really were districted areas to um, some of Miami's entertainment um, neighborhoods. I mean, how, how it's zoned and how it was organized. And in Orlando, um, right currently right now, the spaces for socializing recreation um, that are queer are not in one cornered off designated district. They're kind of peppered throughout um, some areas downtown. So I sort of see the functioning of these communities moving in a more, a slightly more integrated way, um, even if the communities themselves are not integrated, but these spaces are, you know, in, kind of intertwined. And I think the function of that happening makes the presence of the queer community um, in some ways more legible to, to, the, to the dominant um, straight community as well. Um, but there seem to be some kind of non-porous boundaries that are functioning at the same time. So it's a, it's a little bit of a I mean, I would say it's really coded. Like if you are part of those communities and spaces, you know, you know how to get there and where to go. And, um, and if you're not, they, they fade a little bit um, because they're not meant for straight people who are out socializing to come in. So there, does that make some sense at all? Am I, did I answer your question? Do you want to start again? <laughs> no. Uh, I want Alexis to chime in. <laughs> um, so something that comes to mind is during the late 1970s, early 80s, um, according to a lot of the oral histories, there was the emergence of the silicone injections and everything else. And because Parliament House was a very closed uh, space in a way, it was a safe space, but it was a closed space that people who did perform or who were female, female impersonators, they often, through connections, start following that trend as well. Um, so for example, you have Paul Wegman, who, an actor, um, fell into the trend and was warned, like, you're gonna, you know, uh, regret for doing, you're gonna, you're gonna regret doing that because of XYZ. And he himself said that he noticed that he, just, he followed the trend. It was like a little trend that was going on. People were getting injections. People were getting uh, laid on, like, I guess, hormone, hormone therapy or everything else. And once things started opening up, people just kind of like diverge in their own separate ways. So then that little closed community where it was very within itself kind of spreaded out. So then people started realizing, oh, that's not who I am. That's not. What I really like, or whatever the case is. So I think the intersection of queer spaces and entertainment um, 
it does vary, but it seems as if during the 1970s and 80s, there was this, this connection between the two where it allowed the emergence, for example, of the trans community to take that place, to take that, uh, that space and be themselves. But that eventually with um, society being, becoming more inclusive and welcoming gay uh, LGBTQ plus uh, people, you start seeing this trend of like, kind of like what uh, Nikki was saying, it kind of like dissipated. And the, the intersection of queer spaces and entertainment kind of like moved away. So now it's like more, you know, have um, drag queens as straight bars now. It's a common occurrence, you know, whereas in the 1970s, I wouldn't have been heard of. So, yeah. Okay, well, you raised the issue um, of, of using social media um, and um, use of social media and the use of oral history. So um, as we all know, and there is often the discussion about uh, about how to use oral histories because it's one person's memory. Uh, and, and social media, as you pointed out or you alluded to uh, in your papers, social media has a way of, of uh, bringing these voices together and uh, either by being a, the louder voice or the more persistent voice of, of shaping the narrative. Okay. As historians, how concerned should we be about that? Are we putting some of those voices, we're, we're pushing them to the margins uh, because the narrative gets shaped? I think, for example, like my, my project that I'm currently, work, currently working on, I'm trying to collect as much oral history as possible regarding you know, impersonation, um, that community itself. So. Um, their history is all different. And I've come to realize that as well. Um, I unfortunately have a bad habit of simplifying and, and associating the people with a set of group. But then I came to realize with all histories, each individual has a different story, a different narrative. And by showcasing that, you're demonstrating that it's not, it's not all uniform, that there's not really a collective memory, that we need to really take a step back and examine everything even the idea of this uh, linear timeline or this linear uh, history we have presented. Okay, Nikki. Thank you, Alexis. I'm so grateful for your work there. Um, I think what is happening in, in social media is it's social. So it's generated and shaped by this fluid community that really is defining itself in continuous real time. Mm -hmm. So by keeping this work um, off of those spaces, um, it doesn't shelter it, it excludes it. And especially for um, the, the positioning of the LGBTQ History Museum in Central Florida, which is, um, you know, exists fully online as a digital museum, by sharing the content um, that we generate from and for the museum and also the practices of public scholarship, we are um, contributing to that conversation, I think in a way that is extremely significant and resists the shaping of the narrative um, that would exclude uh, these voices and stories. And what do you do to capture them then if they are being excluded? Alexis, go ahead. Yes, um, great point, Nikki. So, so having that conversation on social media, for example, like Facebook, it allows that discourse to emerge, right? And you start realizing the conflicting narratives. Oh, wait, no, that was on that day. No, that was not that person. It was this person. And I think by having that platform to have that discussion, it may seem counterintuitive as a historian in terms of like trying to you know, make a narrative or make a history, but that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of the, of the chaos in a way, because the chaos shows you that history is not this thing. And Facebook is like 
like I said, it's lifetime right in front of you, showing you that no, it's not. So I think that's social media has a, has an interesting role to play in history. Nikki, do you have any anything else to add? Um, yes, one final thought about that. The in my other research, we're mostly using social media to um, to study kind of cultural trends and with really looking at you know quantitative factors engagement um when more vocal members emerge and why and i think what is interesting as a as a as a site that engages with these um queer histories is that we have um we have a, a real opportunity i think to maintain um, kind of our, our discipline's focus of being present to the events and responses to those events, the discourse that's taking place. So I think it's difficult as historians to study what's happening, you know, moment to moment, but we have this fantastic kind of archive that's being generated co like co-created that we are able to um to really study and see where our our counter publics our excluded publics are um, interacting all right i have one more question for you and um and this is one in which um you are part of the history <laughs> uh so uh, nikki pointed out that uh, one of the groups that was that was uh, present, one of the, the queer groups present very early was at UCF and, and um, Ken Kar Karsmansky's uh, nurturing of that organization and, and uh, bringing people into what became um, the museum later on and his valuable contribution to that museum. And that implies, and I think is realistic to think that Students were present from the beginning, and both of you are students. So what do you think students bring to this project uh, that is unique and different and essential to the, to the ongoing of this virtual museum? Either one can start. <laughs> okay. Um, it does allow you um, hands-on, hands-on approach with everything. I think in terms of like academia, you have that separation between you and the community, especially if you're focused on a different era, a different time period. Um, but I think, for example, like the LGBTQ uh, History Museum in Central Florida, it allows people who are even outside of that public sphere to know how history works in that sense and how to gather history, but it also allows the students to realize the challenges that they face as historians, because again, like every narrative is different, every oral history is different, and even the, way, even the ways of conducting oral history, um, for a person who may be introverted, that'll be an issue that you have to confront, and how do you navigate that? Um, so I think as students, this museum, for example, allows you this hands-on approach to really work in the public sphere and realize, and, and it sounds odd, but to provide, it places humanity back on the subject, which is, I think, uh, an issue that a lot of historians face, where we see the, the people that we're studying as subjects, and we kind of disassociate the emotions, the feelings, the all these things. So I know from my personal example, as a medievalist, um, this has allowed me to remember that the subjects that I am focusing on were people, that they were angry, that they were upset, that they were in love, that they, they, they dealt with so much. So I think, yeah, those are my thoughts. <laughs> Nikki? Um, I think a lot about those students, um, especially, you know, university students in um, the 60s and 70s coming together to form a queer space. And, and what, 
um, what a generative and um, exciting time that must have been to um, to build together something. And I think now as kind of a non-traditional PhD student, um, I I think I I hope and to contribute um, that perspective that that really asks questions that maybe um, are because I'm I'm emerging as a researcher. I'm new to these areas. Um, I don't have an established um, research agenda that's been you know ongoing for the last ten years of my tenure track work, and being able to sort of crack open, um, take some risks, you know, look at, look at uh, the social landscape, especially of vulnerable communities that, um, I don't know, that maybe have been excluded because, you know, I mean, because of so many things, right? Research agendas, institutions, funding, whatever. Those, um, in many ways, those are freedoms that um, students don't have to deal with quite yet of all those negotiations and compromises. Um, and having the opportunity to work on um, like on real research, like real sites, um, real questions um, to get to create um, these videos and share them as completed projects and products. Um, that's just, it's, it's so inspiring and exciting to me. I kind of can't believe that they're um, so welcoming to student contributions in this way. And so it, it, you know, it's existing in both places, right? As a, a new researcher that maybe has a fewer limits and, and also being welcomed into the community as a researcher that can make a real contribution. Um, I sure hope those, those first students that really came together to form that that GSU would be proud of what we're doing. I think they would. Uh, and and I, I would add to that what what I see um, as a as a faculty member and as a part of the museum, um, I see that it brings together and it is often difficult history. It's difficult history to research because of the lack of sources. And it's difficult history to process because of the, of the poignancy of the stories that, that you, you hear. Um, but it also, like Nikki said, I think it has been a very welcoming space. And it's been a welcoming space to people who identify as queer. It, it has been a welcoming space to those who identify as allies of the community. It has been a welcoming space to students of color. Um, we have had students who have worked in that museum uh, who are not, who don't live in Orlando, um, who are students of universities elsewhere, who have joined us um, to, to work on projects, to do internships. Um, and I think that has been one of the really important Fits um, to the museum itself, but also to the community making up that that museum. Um, I think that has uh, that to me has really been interesting to watch how that has happened. Um, so, are, is there anything you would like to say before we uh, before we close out this panel? I would like to thank you again and the Florida Historical Florida Society for allowing us to be here in this panel as well. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I believe that we'll be sharing some links to these projects um, and hopefully you'll, our audience will come and check out some of this work. And I am excited for what is ahead. Thank you. Me too. And thank you both for all of your hard work. I will have to say that I've had both of these panelists as students and, and continue to work with them. And, and you can see why I'm pleased to do so. And I thank you, the audience, for being with us today um, for this panel for the Florida Historical Society meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs>